Brothers and sisters, we are continuing our series moving through the book of Acts, going verse by verse. Um, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 4 today, and you'll remember that this is coming on the back of Peter and John healing a man who was lame from birth that Pastor Tim has previously talked about. And so we're going to just pick it up in, in chapter 4 and verse 1, and it says this, Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead, and they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Now Peter and John here in this passage are being arrested and notice the key issue and purpose for their arrest in verse 2 is Jesus and his resurrection from the dead and the truth that they are preaching and proclaiming. Now, most of us have probably never been in a position where uh, we have faced this type of persecution, uh, a position where for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, we could be arrested or beaten. And it, I'm certainly in, there are many places in the world today where that threat is real and that kind of persecution is going on. And it's a real question of, um, it's a real test of our faith to try and think through those scenarios to say, how would we handle a situation like this? Now, maybe you have been mocked or ridiculed or mistreated, but likely you haven't faced the kind of persecution that they saw in the early church. And I always want to mention when we talk about persecution that we have brothers and sisters around the world today that are still going through the same kinds of persecutions as we see here in the book of Acts. And that has happened throughout all of history, all of church history. And so Jesus actually warned his disciples ahead of time about these kinds of things in several places. And for this purpose, I'm going to use Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 9, and we'll read through verse 13, where Jesus warned his disciples ahead of time that these things would come to pass. He says, but watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils and you will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before the rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. I just want to stop there for just a second and just make the comment that you know, some people, you know, teach basically easy believism that you can just, you know, believe, believe in Jesus, trust in Jesus, and then everything in your life is going to be great. But is that what Jesus taught? Is that what Jesus told his disciples? We see here that that is not the case. And he actually warns them that there would be persecution. At one point, Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but do not fear for I have overcome the world. So that is a warning. There is a cost to following Christ. And he says that they would be delivered up to synagogues and be arrested and beat and so on. And he, and he goes on in verse 10 and says, And the gospel must be preached to all nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. So what we are seeing here in the book of Acts are really the prophetic words of Christ being fulfilled, being lived out in these verses. And I want to point out that when the church comes under this kind of persecution, uh, the opportunity to be a witness is increased, and the church throughout history has always thrived under persecution. When faith is tested uh, by the fire, the genuineness of that faith shows through. Continuing back in Acts 4, in verse 4, However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Now, this is still really early on in the birth of the church. And I would say that that's a pretty successful ministry. And some believe this 5,000 may have even been an addition to the 3,000 who were previously added to their number in chapter 2. Um, that really is better numbers than, you know, 
the explosive church growth that we see with like mega churches and stuff today. It's outperforming that. And and might I add that the mega churches have million dollar budgets and, and crazy staffing and all of the state of the art technology of the 21st century. And yet they're outperformed in, in many ways by this unincorporated, financially destitute, persecuted first century church, which is really interesting to think about. And I asked the question, what did this first century church have that we don't have? What was it that was so special about their ministry that, because uh, in a typical scenario, if you saw men and women being persecuted and arrested and so on for their faith, that wouldn't be a draw, but something is going on here. And what do they have that we don't have? And I don't know that there is something that they had that we don't have. Is not the same spirit of Christ afforded to us who even dwells within us? Is it not the same spirit that was in them? Maybe what's missing is, is a willingness to yield to God's spirit. And I'll tell you one thing that they did have that perhaps we're lacking, and that is boldness and passion to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. They weren't concerned who the gospel may offend. They were concerned with keeping it pure and delivering God's truth, not compromising it for anyone and, and in the face of who it might offend. And that becomes quite clear in this chapter. Too many churches today are trying to twist and conform the scriptures to suit their culture when really we should be doing the opposite. Uh, we should be trying to conform our culture to Christ. To those who want to receive Christ, we should be pulling out of the world and into God's plan, into God's will, in conformity with Christ and with, with the scriptures. So our philosophy is this. We will meet anybody from any walk of life right where they're at. And the reason we want to do that, no matter where they, whether they're coming out of, um, out of addiction or out of a, a, a broken home or out of uh, alcoholism or out of prostitution or out of homelessness, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the situation is doesn't matter what the background is. We want to meet everybody right where they're at. Why? Because that's what God does. He, he picks us up wherever we're at in life and he begins, he justifies us and he begins a process of sanctification. And if we're willing to go down that road, God will meet you right here, right now, right where you're at. He will meet you there. And so God is always willing to meet people where they're at. And so are we. Um, because we're trying to follow his example. But there is one catch to that. And that is, God will meet you where you're at. We will meet you where you're at. But you can't stay there. Because that's not God's will for your life. God wants to change. He's in the business of changing and transforming lives through the sanctification of his spirit, through the setting apart. That is what God is in the business to do. And that's what he's all about. And our responsibility is to take up that same ministry of reconciliation started by Jesus Christ himself and carry it out as though God were pleading through us to others to be reconciled to God. And the disciples had a fearlessness and a boldness that the church today desperately needs. Continuing in verse 5, And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Now, in a sense, the priests and the Sadducees are doing their jobs. Now, notice the high priests are there, both of them. The one that's recognized by the Jews and the Roman appointee high priest are both present. And it was sort of their responsibility as teachers to maintain that the truth is being taught and so on. And so they would have to pull aside new teachers. They came in saying, teaching something different than what they were teaching or whatever. They would question them concerning whatever this new teaching was that, that they were presenting. Uh, but remember what Jesus had told his disciples. He had warned them that these things would happen, uh, that when they were brought before rulers and synagogues, it was to be a witness and Peter is not going to miss this opportunity. And so they come together and you see the key issue. Who's, what, what power, by what power, by what name have you done this? That's their concern, okay? 
And so then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Now, he addresses them, and it's important to note it says that Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. And I believe that's for this event, for this occasion. Notice that is different from the baptism of the Spirit that they received in chapter 2. He is now additionally filled with the Spirit for this event. And Jesus had foretold that the Spirit in that very hour would give you the words to speak. We're going to see that played out right here in these coming verses. Verse 9, Peter says, If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well? And this is absolute genius, what Peter says. So they've now been detained overnight. They've been arrested. They're now being it, almost like they're on trial, they're being cross-examined. Is is this why we were here? Is this why we're here? Peter's asking, this, this is why you've arrested us and, and you're questioning us for a good deed done to a helpless man? Boy, that's a that's a real great way to set the, your opening statement, right? And, and then he goes right to the heart of the issue in verse 10. Well, if there's any question he says, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he says, whom you crucified to those that are questioning him, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man stands here before you whole. Which was the purpose of the miracle, by the way, was to point to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Peter doesn't back down at all. He doesn't shrink back at all. He stands up on the soapbox and proudly proclaims the name of Jesus Christ. He didn't shrink back from the message of the resurrection either. In fact, he doubles down on it, boldly proclaiming the truth of Christ, whom God raised from the dead, as the means of this man's healing. And he also kind of pokes his finger in their eye a little bit and says, and by the way, it was you who crucified him. And they say that in front of everyone who's present. Reminds me of what Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, when he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. And it makes me wonder, can we say that, that Paul said, that we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? If you're not there, that's definitely something to ask God to give you that boldness. Verse 11 this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Let's not mince words. He's saying Jesus is the only way. And now we get into this exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ um, kind, of, kind of discussion. Now, Christians are often labeled as being narrow-minded uh, for believing that we have the only means of salvation, the only name um, by which men can be saved. And people get really upset and bent out of shape about it. But it's important to note that we didn't make this up. This is what the book says. This is what God has supernaturally preserved in this message for us to obtain salvation. By the way, there is no other atoning sacrifice for your sin. Nobody else stood in your law place and took the punishment that you rightfully deserve for your sins to offer you forgiveness. No one else has done that but Jesus himself, which is why there is only one name under heaven given amongst men by which we must be saved. Jesus himself said the same in John 14, 6, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's what Jesus said. Luke 11, verse 23, again, the exclusivity of Jesus. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And so the exclusivity of the gospel is something that's confirmed by all the New Testament authors that talk about the issue. And whether it's Paul, whether it's Peter speaking in Acts chapter 2, whether it's Jesus himself in the gospels. And in verse 13, our narrative continues, and it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. 
which I love that verse so much as an uneducated and untrained man myself. I hope and pray to have that same testimony that people um, would realize, hopefully, that I have been with Jesus. And I, I really think that's an excellent goal for all of us to strive for, to have that testimony that people might know that we have been with Jesus. What a great example for us to follow in. Verse 14, and seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. So twice now here in these verses, they could say nothing against it. They, they can't deny this miracle that's, that has been done. And, and so they're, the Jewish religious leaders are running out of options to try and muzzle the apostles at this point. And it says in verse 17, but so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they say, what can we do? We can't deny this miracle that is evident to everyone around. And keep in mind, Peter has already verbally just blistered them in front of everybody who is present by telling them they crucified the Messiah. So they're in a real predicament, and their conclusion is just to severely threaten them not to speak to anyone anymore uh, about Jesus. And let's see how that plays out. Let's see if, if Peter and John now just roll over because they've been threatened. And now you have to understand, these are the most prominent people and, and the most powerful people in that community at that time, outside of the Roman government itself. Um, if they call you in there, these guys do have the authority clearly to arrest you, to have you beaten, maybe even to do other things to you. Um, so people listen to them. If they're threatened by one of the Sadducees or one of the high priests, uh, yeah, you, you better listen to them. These guys are used to people doing what they say. But that's not the case, as we'll see with Peter and John. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot speak, but we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them, because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Fearless, passionate, and bold as a lion, God gave them the words to say they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I believe that God can do the same thing through any one of us today. Now, God somehow preserved them through this situation, which, you know, they easily could have suffered the same kind of crucifixion death for really preaching the same things that Jesus had preached. But God preserved them for his plan and for his purposes at this time. And it's really amazing to see Jesus' words that played out. This is just a really powerful passage. And I just want to wrap this up with another just call to boldness, to not, not be a coward, about our faith, but to really, to really be stirred up for Jesus Christ. And this comes from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Paul, you know, really giving Timothy a charge here. He says, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. A charge. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, a spirit of timidity, but one of power, and there is power in the testimony and in, and in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we ought to share that with others. He says he saved us and given us a holy calling. We have a calling from God to be bold about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's pray for God 
to remove all fear and timidity and replace it with his passion, boldness, and commitment to the call that he has given us as believers. And by his power, may we boldly proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ, which brings salvation in the midst of any and all adversity that may come our way. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this passage. We thank you for the inspiration that we can glean from it, God. And I pray, Lord, that you would empower each person who's praying with me now. Empower them by your Holy Spirit to be fearless, to be bold, to be passionate, and to be committed to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can come to you, Lord, and we pray it would be so. In Jesus' name, amen.